thank you all so much for coming to today's Third on Third lecture. I'm Jared, and I'm the curator here at the Amelia Island Museum of History. Now, before we get started today, I would like to ask if everyone could please turn off or silence their cell phones so we don't have any interruptions while our speaker is presenting. Now, before I turn it over to our speaker, I do have a few quick announcements about upcoming events and programs happening at the museum. December's Brown Bag Lunch will be presented by Regina Gale Phillips, the Executive Director of the Lincolnville Museum and Cultural Center in St. Augustine. The Lincolnville Museum documents the history of St. Augustine's historically black neighborhood and is located in the preserved building of St. John County's first black public high school. Ms. Phillips will share with us the story of saving that school, its history, and its transformation into an African American cultural center. Ms. Phillips will join us on the afternoon of December 6th so join us then to learn about this fascinating history. Next month's Third on Third lecture will be the exhibit opening for the museum's newest exhibit about the life and work of Steve Leinberg. We'll be joined by a panel of community members and friends of Steve, sharing their experiences, having their portraits taken by Steve, and giving a sense of his artistic approach. After hearing from the panel, you'll have a chance to be the first guest to see the new exhibit, so mark your calendars now for December 15th. Now, without further delay, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker for the evening. Dr. George Aaron Broadwell is the Elling Eyed Professor of Anthropology and the Chair of uh, the Department of Linguistics at the University of Florida. His research focuses on Native American languages of the southeastern United States, which you will hear about shortly. With that, I ask you all to join me in introducing and in welcoming Dr. Broadwell. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me to be here tonight. Um, so tonight I'm going to be talking to you about uh, <clears throat> the oldest Native American letter from the United States. It was written here in the state of Florida in 1651. We call this the Jesus Maria letter. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you about how we've been working to produce a new translation of that. This letter is written in the Tamuka language, which I'll tell you a little bit more in a second. So as Jared said, I'm George Aaron Broadwell from University of Florida. Okay, so to tell you a little bit about the Tamuka people, you probably heard a lot about them. They were the native people of this area right here. So we're right in the heartland of Tamuka area. So here on the map, we see approximately where Tamuka people lived. And you see Jacksonville and adjacent areas right in the center of that. Uh, we do not know how many Tamuka people there might have been, but uh, some archeologists estimate that perhaps there were 100,000 of them at the time of contact with Europeans in the early 16th century. So um, as you guys probably know, the Spanish were here for about 200 years in Florida. They established uh, St. Augustine in 1565 and then they were forced to leave in 1763. So um, during that time, terrible things happened to the Tamuka people, uh, partly the fault of the Spanish, partly other sort of factors that, uh, that uh, played a role in the decline of the population of Tamuka people. But at the time that um, Spanish people left Florida, there were only about 200 identified people left. Uh, let's say these were people who were living in the missions near St. Augustine, and they were converted to Christianity at this point. So uh, in 1763, the Spanish left St. Augustine. They got on boats, and they went to Havana, Cuba, which was still a uh, Spanish colony at that point. So we know that about 200 people went with the Spanish to Cuba. Probably prior to that, a lot of uh, Tamuka people also escaped in other ways. So they may have run away from the conflict and the war uh, up near the border with Georgia, and may have gone further south into Florida, where perhaps they intermarried with other Native Americans. Maybe some of their descendants are among the Seminole today. We're not exactly sure. We know that also during the um, 17th century, there was a lot of slave raiding. Uh, and at that period, slaving involved Native American people. So um, the British and their uh, Native allies were conducting extensive slave raiding in North Florida 
during the late 17th century, and a lot of Temuco people were taken as slaves and probably sold into the slave trade in the Carolinas. So it might also be that some descendants of Temuco people uh, continue as uh, uh, partly uh, African American, Native American people from the Carolina coast. That would be our best guess. Although there are probably still descendants of Tanuka people, they no longer exist as a distinct tribal group. So they're sort of dispersed and intermarried with other people. Um, so the letter that I want to talk to you about tonight is called the Jesus Maria Letter, as I said. This is the oldest letter written in a native language of the US. Uh, it's a letter of complaint to the Spanish governor of Florida. And um, it was written in 1651, as I said. After it was written in Temuqua, it was translated in Sp into Spanish at the same time. And both the Temuqua original and the Spanish translation were sent first to the governor of Florida and then eventually to Spain. Okay. And the reason that we have this letter, essentially, is that it ended up in Spain. It was preserved with other kind of archives there. Most things that were written on paper in colonial Florida would have rotted. So the preservation of that is not good. Mostly what we have from that period is stuff that was sent <laughs> elsewhere in the world. Okay. So um, this uh, Spanish translation, along with the original, it's in the thing called the Archivo General de Indias, which is in Seville, Spain. And historians discovered this letter probably 50 years ago. But um, at the time, nobody could read the Tamuqua version, so all of our history so far has been based on the Spanish version of the letter. So uh, I've been working with, for the last couple of years, maybe actually 10 years now, with Alejandra Dukowski, who was a historian of Spanish colonial Florida. She knows the history of the area extremely well, and I am a linguist. So we set out together to explore this language and try to translate the original native language letter. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Uh, I'll give you just a second to look at it. So you can see that at the top of the letter, it says, Jesus Maria, right? Yeah, you can make out a few words in there. Mostly, though, this is going to be Tamuqua, so I wouldn't expect you to be able to read it. So here's the front and back of the first page of it. And here's the front and back of the last page. Here's the signature of the writer. Um, his name was uh, Don Manuel Polata. Polata is chief. We'll look at that in a little bit more detail in a second. But that's basically what this these two pages of this letter look like. Yes? So, I don't remember the Tamukum having a written language, right? So right. how did this get written in Tamukum? Yes, so you're anticipating what I'm just, oh, just I'm about to do. <laughs> okay. I'll show you my slides, and then we'll come back to that question. Okay. okay. All right. So how is this written? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So uh, to understand this letter, we have to understand the Tamuqua language, but we also have to learn how it is that Tamuqua people became able to read and write their language, right? Then we need to know about other things that were written and published in the language. Then we need to talk about trying to understand the Tamuqua language. How is it that we can understand this language that has not been spoken for 200 years or so, more than 200 years? Um, and then we need to look at discrepancies between Temuco originals and the Spanish translations that were made at the same time. So there are a couple of stages in understanding, translating, and interpreting this letter. Okay. So, a little bit about the language. Um, this language was once spoken right around <coughs> here. Um, various place names around here refer to uh, the Temuco language. You guys all know the Tamukum Preserve is not too far from here. Uh, we are not sure how it is related to other Native American languages. Uh, it might be related to the uh, language family just to the north. Muskegeean is the language family that includes uh, Seminole Creek and Miccosukee, 
which are now spoken down in the Everglades, as well as uh, other languages like Chickasaw and Choctaw. Uh, that relationship is unproven. It takes a long time to convince linguists of a relationship. There is some tentative evidence, but it's not definitely proven. So right now we consider Tmutla to be what we call an isolate. An isolate linguistically is the equivalent of an orphan, right? Everybody has parents, but in some cases we don't know who the parents are, right? So the Dubuqua language is related to some other language in the world, but we just don't know what that relationship is. Partly because it's not spoken and we don't have as many records of it as we would like. So how did the language come to be written? Well, as part of the Spanish colony, uh, there's first, around 1565, there's the military and civil government come to Florida. They establish the city of St. Augustine, and they establish sort of a general uh, administration for themselves, a way to, to establish their city. Um, about 30 years, roughly, later, we get a Spanish priest coming to convert the local Indians. So the priests who come are Franciscans from Spain. And the first priest who came who was most uh, thoroughly involved with the language was Pareja, Francisco Pareja. Um, so uh, he worked on the language from roughly 1595 to about 1627. And then he went to Mexico and died. And uh, his successor was a guy named Gregorio de Movia, who picked up the work that Pareja had left. And then Pareja produced two other uh, volumes. So when I say what they produced, these are printed books. I'll show you some pictures in a second. So there are catechisms, a confessional, a doctrina. There might have been other materials that have been lost, like a dictionary. But this is what we have. Um, these were published between 1612 and 1635. Um, when I say published, I mean on a printing press. So you have to remember that in the early 17th century, printing was um, a fairly new technology, right? Uh, printing presses were big, complicated machines that required a lot of training uh, to operate and also were expensive, so there were not very many of them. Um, there was no printing press in colonial Florida. The closest printing press was in Mexico City. So the way these books were printed is Father Pareja was quite close to here, living here, working with native people, and writing things down by hand. When he had a manuscript that was complete, it was put on a ship and sent uh, you know, through the Gulf, probably to Veracruz, Mexico, and then overland to Mexico City to be printed. And then the books came back here to this region for the uh, evangelization of native people. Now, none of the books that were used here have survived because Florida is the way it is, right? But what we know is that for a lot of these books, one or two copies went back to Europe. And in general, those are the ones that we have, right? So there's quite a lot of long books published in Tamuqua. Um, there are also two handwritten letters, including the 1651 that's the topic of my thing today. So if you take all of the books that were published plus the two handwritten letters, there are about 2,000 pages of Tamuqua text. 2,000 pages of Tamuqua text. It's really remarkable. Um, this is the most extensively documented native language uh, uh, that early from the United States. Um, it is much, much earlier than anything else in the US. Um, and it is immense. And uh, up until now, up until the last 10 years or so, it's been kind of a mystery how to approach this material, how to interpret it, because there are no longer any speakers. There's not a dictionary of the language. How do you make heads or tail out of 2,000 pages printed in this no longer spoken language. OK. So my friend here in the front asked, how did people uh, learn to read and write this language? And so this is a woodcut from one of the books that was printed in the Tocqueville language. And um, I'd like to ask, what do you think is going on in this picture? 
Jesus, something about Christian doctrine. Some teaching is going on, right? And punishing someone. Yes, <laughs> very good, right? So this guy right here, he is the uh, Spanish official called a fiscal. He's sort of like the teacher of the class. And these students down here, they're working on their lessons. And this kid has come up to have his lesson book examined. He's probably okay. This one has not done too well. <laughs> He's being whipped for having missed his lesson. Uh, and the, the Tamuqua text underneath it says, Fiscalima ano alo bosotema a bototela oro bista maca. And that means the fiscal orders that the lazy person be beaten. <laughs> I will also say about this woodcut, these don't look very much like Florida Indians. Um, these, this print actually probably comes from the Nahua, uh, the Aztec people in central Mexico. The clothes kind of match that. But, you know, they were printing this book in Mexico, and they had that press, that print handy, that woodblock. So they just reprinted it into the Tamuqua thing with the Tamuqua caption underneath. Right? Kind of nice, huh? Okay. So the way that the literacy worked is that the, the Franciscans set up village schools to teach people to read and write in their native language, Tamuqua. There was no written version of the language before the Spanish got here. So one of the first jobs is that Pareja had to figure out a way to read it, to write this language. He used the letters of the Spanish alphabet the best he could. He tried to write down what he heard. Luckily, uh, this language, the phonology, is not super complicated. Nearly all the sounds, so far as we can tell, are also found in Spanish. So there were letters to represent the sounds he heard. And so we can basically make pretty good sense out of the way that he wrote it. And um, apparently these schools were successful enough that lots of native people actually did learn to read and write. Now, why did the Spanish do this? It was not out of the goodness of their hearts or a general love of education. Mm -hmm. They taught the students to read and write so they could read the catechism. They could read other Catholic religious materials. That was their intention. Right? They did not want a school of Tamuka creative writing, for example. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. So the reason you understand the um, caption is because you've seen it in Spanish? No, I can read Tamuka. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm one of, one of about three people in the world who can. I have slowly taught myself over the years to read an extinct language, yes, in the back. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there are about 2,000 pages to move one. Yeah. How much of that uh, would you have translations for? That's a good question. Um, 60% 60. 60 of it, maybe? Here in the audience is one of the other three people. <laughs> 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 I like the Spanish. How did that get yeah. produced? Yeah. Uh, by, uh, that, so that you would have sort of Rosetta Stone style. Yeah. Most of it is, is parallel. Like I'll show you in a second. Most of it is Tamuk one, one side, Spanish on the other. So you can kind of tell what is intended to say. But then there are also long passages in Tamukwa that have no translation. And one of the books is a monolingual Tamukwa book with no Spanish printed. We have figured out that it is a translation of some book that was being published in Europe at the time. So we got that book, and we tried to match up the parts of the European book and the Tamuqua book. And I think we mostly got it done. But it's really, yeah, it's challenging. Most of it, there's some translation, but very important, significant parts are not translated. Okay. So here's a picture of one of these books. This is the uh, Confessionario. And this was published in 1613, you see. So it says, uh, printed with permission in Mexico in the press of the widow of Diego Lopez <coughs> de Valos. Right? So a confessional for people who didn't grow up uh, with the Catholic Church, it's a list of, um, organized by the Ten Commandments, but other things as well. And it goes through each commandment. 
and it lists every possible way in which you might have violated this commandment. <laughs> Yay. And, and then the, the person who's doing the confession would be interrogated by the priest. Did you disrespect your mother? Did you disrespect your father? Did you say that your father should fall in a hole? Did you call someone an, an you know, whatever a tmuk insult would be? So a long list like that. Excuse uh, me. Yes. I'm looking at this and going, wow, this looks a lot like Spanish. Yes, this is Spanish. Uh, it's the Spanish um, front page of the book. Okay. But then if we look inside, uh, there's another front page of a catechism. If we look inside, though, we can see that the Spanish will be in the left column oh, okay. and the Tamuka will be in the right. So, for example, this first one says, Confesaste te la cuaresma pasada. Did you confess the, the last Lent? Right? And then we have the same thing in Tamuka, cuaresma yo qua nupirama oro bini bicho. Okay. So the way you begin to understand the language, you try to match up these two sides, right? If it's sort of like short little things right next to each other, at the you'll think, ah, oh, this is not so bad. I can figure this out. But then also, you get pages like this, where here's this long passage in Spanish, all of this. And then there's this much longer passage in Temuco after it. And somehow, things in here have to be matched up with things in here. And this is the thing that, yeah, is the challenge. And when I started this, I didn't have any white hair. But, <laughs> uh, now I do. Yeah. But it's been, a, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a great puzzle. OK. So uh, the other thing that has made it hard to study this language is there's no dictionary of it. Um, so Pareja wrote in 1614, a very funny little book called an arte. So an arte is the Latin word for a little grammar, like the sort that people would study when they learn Latin in school or Greek in school. It's sort of short. It's not quite finished. It has a lot of handwritten corrections. And it was never finally published. It was sort of half published and annotated and corrected. And then the, the last part of it is just handwritten. Um, so it's kind of not a very good source for Tamuqua grammar, but it has actually a, about 400 words with their Spanish translations next to them. So that's like the little nucleus for a dictionary. And um, when you look at the text, you find another at least 2,500 other words in the text. And then you can try to deduce what they mean from looking at the context in which they appear. So um, I, along with my trusty group of students at University of Florida, worked for about four years. And we got all of these records transcribed into a giant linguistic database uh, that now has about 148,000 words. And we've published an online dictionary of the language. We update the dictionary pretty uh, regularly when we figure out new words. And, um, a lot of the words in the dictionary will say things like uh, unknown verb. <laughs> <laughs> like it's better than nothing, right? Yeah. We can tell it's a verb because it has verb prefixes and verb suffixes, but it appears maybe once, and so we don't know what it means. So bit by bit, we improve the dictionary, figure out new words, and make it better. Also, a lot of words with parentheses, question marks. Parentheses question mark, yes. So uh, a collection of texts like this, this is what linguists call a corpus. Um, the plural of that is corpora. So um, one of the big things that has happened in the technology of linguistics in the last 15, 20 years is computer-assisted analysis of corpora. So this is a hard enough problem. I will tell you honestly, I started to look at this problem about 20 years ago, and I thought, this problem is impossible. This is too hard to solve. Nobody could work out this language without a dictionary, without a grammar, and with these strange texts. And then maybe 15 years ago, some software became available 
for doing this kind of thing. And I thought, you know that super hard problem of trying to crack this language? Maybe if I had computational help, I could actually solve it. So I started to pursue that. And um, the particular program I'm using is called Fieldworks Language Explorer. It's a piece of software developed for um, making dictionaries, analyzing corpora, doing linguistic analysis. It's very powerful, and it has some really good search utilities. Um, so when you're trying to figure out uh, part of the grammar, like suppose you want to say my noun, right? What you'd really like, if you want to be sure, how does the language express my such and such? You want to look at hundreds of examples of it, right? So you can find all of the examples in Spanish of me plus a noun, right? Or you could find every Tamuco word that ends with M-I-L-E to try to figure out what that suffix means. So being able to quickly locate all the examples that match a pattern helps a linguist to crack a language. I think I've got some screenshots here. So I don't know if all of you can see this. It's not too important if you can't, but basically what we're doing here is we're, the first line is the printed Tamuco text. Uh, here's the Spanish that's published next to it. So uh, here are the, the Spanish means, did the confessor perhaps tell you to restore some stolen thing and did you not return it to its owner? And then we have to figure out in here what means thing, stolen, return, priest, tell, you, right? Have to find like all the little parts of the words that mean those things. And as we're trying to work it out, we, we're trying to figure out like what does nuque mean? Nuque is a verb that actually it turns out to mean steal. And the way we figure it out is we look at, in this case, 52 examples of nuque in the text and we see that in every case the Spanish text either says the word steal or alludes to stealing in some way, right? So that's the way you go about trying to crack this kind of problem. Okay, so the only attempt at this grammar uh, of this language from the time was this arte I mentioned. It's really uh, hard to interpret. There are a lot of um, things that are, I don't know how to put it, it's like he's describing a different language sometimes. Um, he doesn't mention at all things that are very, very frequent in the text. And then he gives a lot of attention to odd little suffixes that never show up anywhere in our text. Um, the text corpus gives us a much more balanced view of the language. I will also say Parejo, who wrote this, he was trained to be a priest. He was not trained to be a linguist, right? And he was not a particularly good linguist. He was trying to make the best sense he could of a very complicated language that was completely unlike Spanish. So he was making an attempt, but it is kind of a big mess at points. Okay. So having said that he was not a very good linguist, um, brings me to another point that I wanted to talk about a little bit. Um, so when we look at, let's look back at this parallel text here. Here. Um, and I want to ask the question, like, who is the author of this text? <coughs> what do you think? The Spanish? Okay, well, so this text over here on the Spanish, right, that comes from some standard <coughs> confessional yeah. back in Spain. So Pareja didn't, he didn't author that, he just copied it from another book, right? And then this part, where did that come from? Who did that? Okay, well, you know, you might think, this is what history books about the Tabuco used to say is, Pareja came here incredibly quickly. He learned to speak the Tabuco language, and he himself translated all of this material into Tabuco. Don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> the argument I'm gonna to make to you, like, in the Tamuco corpus and in most texts from this period is that the people who did the translation here are native people, right? So what happens is uh, young people go to uh, Franciscan schools. They become bilingual in Spanish as well as Tamuco. They learn to read and write. And I, I think 
those sort of bilingual young people are the ones producing these translations into Tanupa over here. I'm going to try to convince you of this by showing you some places where the Spanish and the Tanupa don't match, and the ways in which they don't match are pretty indicative of what's going on. So let's go forward and look at some of that. Okay, so um, as I said, the Spanish is selected and adapted from other things. Uh, the Tamuqua, how was it composed? Well, the one that you read in older history books is that Pareja could speak this language and translate it all by himself, you know, sitting alone in his house. Another possibility, not really mentioned, is that he worked with these converts. They translated the Spanish for him on the spot, and then he wrote it down. He wrote down the translations of his assistants. Or a fourth possibility is that he's got some trusted converts who wrote this translation while Pareja was present and supervising every word of it. Or the last one, where a Tamupa convert or various converts were assigned portions, they wrote the translations and returned them to Pareja. And I'm going to argue for this last one. So um, what you can think of is, uh, imagine yourself as Father Pareja. You know, I've got 120 pages of Spanish confessional to translate. Right? <coughs> How am I going to accomplish this? Right? So I think his strategy is, I'm going to give these 20 pages to Manuel. I'm going to give these 20 pages to Pedro. I'm going to give these 20 to Luisa and these to Maria. And then they're all going to write them, and they're going to bring them back to me. And I'm going to compile them into a book. Right? Yes? Uh, or if he really wanted to double check, he could have uh, somebody that knows Tamuqua and Spanish translate it back into Spanish. That's true. And as a, as a check to see that they weren't uh, saying, um, hooray, hi, is ugly, or something. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been wise for him to adopt a strategy like that because then he would have discovered that the Timucua doesn't say what he thinks it says. <laughs> okay, so I'll just say in the last scenario, Pareja is really more like the editor of this book than he is the author, right? He's taking Spanish from somewhere, he's taking Timucua from a couple of different people, putting it all together as the editor, making a clean copy, and sending it to Mexico to be printed. Okay, so arguments for this. First, uh, as it turns out, there are different dialects of Tamuqua. And um, if you study this language for a while, you can say, ah, you know, in this dialect, they say hachi bono to mean thing. And in this dialect, they say hachi bueno to, say, to mean thing. Um, I started to notice these kind of discrepancies for a while. And then an unusual pattern uh, started to appear to me. So. Um, I found out that the 1612 book and the 1613 book are in different dialects of Tamuqua, right? So if Pareja is translating them all, it's very mysterious that in 1612 he chose to do it into one dialect, 1613 <laughs> he did it into a, a different dialect. Then looking more carefully at the 1613 uh, book, I found actually that that book is made up of three parts, roughly. The first part is in dialect A, the middle part is in dialect B, and the last part goes back to dialect A. So in the middle of this book, it switches into a different dialect. <coughs> Very mysterious, right? Uh, from the tr Pareja's translator theory, I think that's inexplicable. But think about compiling translations written by different people. So let's say, First third is written by one person, the middle third by a different person, and then the last third maybe by the first person again. You take these different documents together, you compile them all and have them printed, and then the middle part actually represents a different speaker of Tamuqua, not the same as the first or the last part. Uh, so there's this dialect diversity. I won't bore you with too many statistical charts about different Tamuqua dialects, but I have satisfied myself, which is important. For <laughs> then there are also discrepancies in the meanings of the Spanish and the Tamuqua. The Tamuqua often says something quite different from the Spanish. 
and Pareja is really unlikely to produce these kind of divergencies. And then in general, I want to talk about literacy in Tamuqua and why it's possible that there were literate Tamuquas working on these projects. Okay. So the middle of the Confessionario, the 1613 book, is a different part of the manuscript. This is the one that's in a different dialect. And in the middle of this section is a long segment that asks these confessants about their maintenance of traditional beliefs. It's called, in Spanish, Ceremonios Agueros y Supersticiones que aún usan algunos, which means ceremonies, auguries, and superstitions that some still follow. So these are traditional non-Christian practices. And one part of the confessional is to interrogate the Indians about whether they're continuing to do their traditional things. So uh, when we're able to better understand the Tamuqua, we can find different kinds of divergence. So there are a couple of different ways. So there's cases where the Spanish and the Tamuqua are approximately the same, but they emphasize different things. Or they're approximately the same, but the Tamuqua adds or omits some negative condemnation of the practice. Or the Spanish and Tamuqua contain approximately the same, but the Tamuqua is less euphemistic than the Spanish. Or the Spanish and Tamuqua differ, and the Tamuqua adds or omits something significant. And you have to understand Tamuqua to do this. But let's look at some examples and give you an idea of how it works. So just to explain the, the layout of the screen here, this is the Tamuqua that's printed in the book. And this is the Spanish printed next to it. So what you should do probably is first read the Spanish, the translation of the Spanish here and then read the translation of the Timucua. I'll give you a second to look at it, and then we can talk about what differences you see between the two sides. I hope you guys in the back can see it. Can't see it? You're too far away. OK, I'll read it for you. How about that? So the, the Spanish here says, if she were single and it is known that she is pregnant, it is to be said to her that she is not to abort or choke the unborn child as they are accustomed to do. Daughter, although you have fallen into mortal sin, beware that you will fall into an even more serious one if you have brought about a miscarriage. Don't commit such a grave sin, even if it means shame. Carry it to God. Okay. What the Tamukwa over here says is, if you are a single woman and are pregnant, you have committed a great sin, but it is more shame when you kill the child. This is the greater sin called mortal sin, if you're a single woman and are ashamed, you must not kill. So differences between these two sides. What do you think? Well, women had a hard time back then. <laughs> they did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the two, That's not much of a choice. <laughs> yeah, the two are sort of, they're talking about the same thing, yes. right? But the Spanish has a lot of stuff in here that gets left out of the Tamuqua, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So they don't mention, in Tamuqua, they don't mention choking the child. They don't mention bringing about a miscarriage. Uh, they don't have this thing at the end, carry it to God, right? And I would also say there's a little bit of a focus, different focus. The Spanish is really more about shame. Uh, the Tamuqua is really more about murder, I guess you would say has kind of a different emphasis. So it's refreshing to read both sides, to give you both perspectives on this. Yeah, and I if find you, it interesting, it's, yeah. it, and it is known that she is pregnant. It is known that she is pregnant, yes. Oh. I mean, if people don't know. It's totally <laughs> well, you know, and, and the other thing to think about this is, this Spanish text was written for people back in Europe. Yeah. Right, so it reflects what was going on in Spain, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, when, when women had children that they didn't want, right? Yeah. And the things that they list and condemn here are things that Spanish women were doing, right? The things listed over here are things that the Tamuqua translator thought would be appropriate for the Florida audience, right? Yeah. Yes? It would seem those superstitions and all that would be yeah. very valuable anthropological. Absolutely. Yeah, it's about the Tamuqua. Culture. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm working with my, my friend over here and another one or two people. We're going to be publishing a new translation of the superstitions 
sometimes yeah. next year. I mean, this is obviously like two cultures that are you know, using language in a different way, but I'm just curious, when was the last, you said that at a certain point, the Tumukwa were not considered to be a culture anymore, they were dispersed, and therefore they didn't have a culture that was being carried on like that? Was that at this time? That was after this. So this is okay. 1613, when things are still relatively good for the Tamukwas. Around the years 1660 to 1690 are when there are big epidemics and wars and slave raiding. So their culture is kind of, kind of destroyed, or they are kind of destroyed as a tribe, um, maybe 50 to 80 years after this is written. That's what I was yeah, they're still pretty intact in 1613. Yes. The Spanish seems like it's um, partly written directed to the priest doing the confession, yes, and partly written to the person making the confession. Yes, the Tumakwan is completely to the person doing the confession. I think making the confession. There's no instruction to the priest. I think you're right. So if we look at the Tumakwa, it's in the second person. It's addressed to the confessor, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And as you note, the Spanish is partly. Uh, as you said, partly to the priest and partly to the woman, right? So they have different perspectives on how to approach this. Yes, Matt. I, I wonder if uh, there aren't two different understandings of what mortal sin is. <laughs> um, it seems like in the Tamuk one, it means to kill somebody. Mm -hmm. And mortal sin has a different meaning in traditional Catholicism. So there would be two mortal sins described in the Spanish. Oh. And only one moral sin described in the Tumukwa. That's a very nice point. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. good point. It helps that the, the word moral sin here is right there in the third to last line. It's ine kalua ikuoma. Yeah. Which is a uh, bad deed. Bad kills. Bad bad good. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so let's look at the kills. Yeah, it's the equal the killing. Let's look at another example of this. Um, so. Um, here the, uh, the translation of the Spanish says, exercising matrimony, has it been in the ordinary way? Or have you desired that it be in another way? <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> so the Tamuk was a, a much more straightforward on this point. It says, <laughs> with having sex with your wife, did you use that which must not be used? And did you want to do it? <laughs> <laughs> Were there any pictures with this? <laughs> Another one. Um, have you sometimes consented not to have sex in the ordinary way? And the Tamukwa says, Did the man who had sex with you have sex with you from behind? <laughs> Look how long that word is. <laughs> sometimes to know what the Spanish even means, but the Tamuk was usually quite straightforward. So the Spanish says, being in your custom, have you walked with anybody? <laughs> what does that mean, right? But the Tamuk will explain, were you penetrated by a man while menstruating? <laughs> so we'll get off the sex. <laughs> no, actually, we won't. We have one more. Okay. So... Uh, have you consented that somebody walk with your spouse, is what the Spanish says? And actually, I've got the wrong translation here. Uh, this, the Tamukwa says, have you pardoned your spouse when he or she wanted to have sex with another person? Because there's not 
different gendered pronouns, and there's just a single word for spouse in here. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, that's really different, right? One is giving consent, and the other is pardoning your spouse. Right? Um, so this is one of my favorite ones that I think shows that the priest didn't translate it. So um, the, the Spanish says, have you arranged that someone be married according to the Indian way without first giving notice to the parish priest? So what is the Indian way according to the Indian way? So the literal translation of the Tanukwa says, did you advise that the ceremony should be according to their desires and that the woman should consent and then that the man should consent? That's nice. Who got left out of the Tanuka translation? <laughs> the priest. Okay, is a priest going to make a translation that leaves himself out? No. no. Okay. Not translated by the priest. Okay. So, the, the Spanish intention in translating uh, these documents was to have native people read them in their own language. So there was this mission education that including tr it included training to Lucas to read and write. Uh, we know that there were other things like spellers and reading books, but they have not survived. They're mentioned in some letters and correspondence. Um, we know that these converts to Christianity learned to recite prayers and to read things from uh, these books. Um, we also know that uh, later on, Native people wrote letters to each other and to the Spanish authorities in the 17th century. Um, and I'll also just mention a brief thing here, which is not on the slide, but um, you know, writing is a kind of technology, right? We forget that because it's so pervasive now. But to people who don't have writing, when writing arrives from Europe, it's a very powerful tool. And you can think of writing as a European technology like uh, horses, right, or iron, or things like that that they also did not have here in Florida. When those things arrived in Florida, at first they were brought here to be tools of colonial oppression, right? But very quickly, native people got control of those technologies. And we know how they used uh, horses and how they use steel to fight for themselves and their rights. But what you also find is they use writing to fight for their rights. So writing is up there with other important uh, technologies of resistance to colonial oppression. And that's what we're going to see when we get to this letter in a few minutes. Okay. So the 1651 letter, it's a letter written specifically to protest the taking of native land. But it is a careful and nuanced protest against Spanish colonial authority. Uh, I said earlier, it's the uh, earliest surviving letter written by a native person in a native language uh, of the US. It's written by Don Manuel, who was the chief of a town called Asile. Um, the town of Asile is about halfway between Gainesville and Tallahassee. There's a river in that part of Florida called the Osceola River. You've been there? Well, the town of Asile was right on that river. That river used to be the boundary between Tamuqua people and the Appalachians who lived further west. This town was right on the border. And so it was strategically important. And also a lot of uh, important political stuff was going on in that part of sort of western Florida at that point. So, uh, as I said, it was uh, on this Osceola River. And uh, what happened in this case is the, the Spanish were accustomed to eating wheat and things made out of wheat. But um, they had to import all their wheat from Europe, which was slow and very expensive. So they had the idea, why don't we grow wheat here in Florida? <laughs> um, as you can imagine, it did not work at all. <laughs> it was a complete and utter failure. But they had an experiment. They started in 1646. Um, and I'm sorry, I think my, this is, should be a ceiling, I think. 
Like this auto-corrected to aisle. My apologies. <laughs> you know, you know how Microsoft Office is, right? So uh, in 1646, they decided they were going to try this experiment, and they convinced the uh, local authorities to let them borrow some land. There was going to be the site of this experiment. They cleared the land. They planted wheat seeds, um, and they recruited Tamuka people and Appalachian people to come work in the fields. And they promised them iron tools, clothes, and other kinds of goods, which they never delivered. So the native people worked in this wheat field in Florida for about two years before the Spanish decided this is a complete disaster and nothing is working. They abandoned the project deciding wheat cannot be grown here. Um, during the time that this was going on, there was a Spaniard named Agustin Perez, uh, who was the primary overseer of this plantation. There were also two African slaves who worked under him and also were kind of like overseers, basically. They treated these workers harshly. I said, actually, it was aban abandoned after about a year. So then the big question is after the, this plantation failed, who owned that land? Okay. Did the land revert to the Tamuqua people who had lent it to the Spanish? That was the native position. The Spanish position was, uh, this land was given to us, and now we have it, and we'll do with it as we like. And so there was a legal dispute then over this land, and that's what eventually led to this letter. So uh, in 1651, the Franciscan missionaries, who were on the side of the natives on this particular issue, they urged the native people to demand the return of the land. And they organized various sort of letters on behalf of the Tamuqua people. Uh, most of those letters are in Spanish, but there's that Tamuqua language letter from Don Manuel, the chief. And they bundled all these letters together, and they sent them uh, to St. Augustine. The Tamuqua letter was translated, it, then it was looked at by the governor, and eventually ended up in, in um, Spain. So uh, Manuel, in the letter he writes, he talks about all the ways in which the native people were abused by the overseers. Uh, he talks about the failure to deliver these uh, promised goods, so they never got the clothes and tools that they were promised. And he also stresses that uh, the he only gave the Spanish temporary use of this land. He loaned it to them. According to the letter, he says, truly I did not give it, but I lent it to him. It should be known, my lord. And also, I did not want to, but from fear I lent it to him. I did not give the land, but I lent it to him. It should be known, my lord. Um, and a big surprise, the governor, after looking at all these letters, and evaluating the evidence ruled in favor of the native owners, and the land was returned. <laughs> oh, good question. Can we have him as our governor? I, I, I should know the answer to this, but I cannot think of what his name was. So whoever this, the governor of colonial Florida was in 1651. I don't know. Somewhere it is in this document, but I forgot. It's in the essay. <laughs> okay, so um, short-term victory and long-term loss. So in 1651, the native people won this case, and the land returned to their control temporarily, but pandemics had already reduced the native population by as much as 80%. Wow. There were unsuccessful native uprisings in 1647 in Appalachia and 1656 in Tamuqua. Um, there was slave writing from the British and allied tribes, especially the Yamasee, and that they started taking a lot of Florida Indians in the 1660s, and the mission towns, especially in eastern Florida, were abandoned, and the residents were relocated to safer places. And by 1700, Spain has pretty much lost control of this colony. They were distracted by their wars in Europe. Um, and so uh, when they finally gave it up in 1763, uh, there were a few hundred native people left. And like I said, 
they might, the descendants might be in Cuba among a native, other native groups or people who are mixed African native heritage. Okay. So there again is the, the letter that we were talking about. I wanted to show you in a little bit more detail just the last bit of it. So, um, so here we see San Miguel Asile Holata Manuel Istala, and that means Don Manuel Holata, or chief of the town of San Miguel de Asile, says it. So, and one of our favorite quotes from him, he says, the land, this land that God caused to exist for us is not good, but I will not divide it and give it. I will not do it for the representative of the king. So it's an early example of native defiance, basically, native resistance. So we produced the first modern translation of this letter. Uh, as uh, I talked about earlier, uh, that letter was translated at the time by a priest and the, the uh, original Tamuco plus the Spanish ended up in Spain. And I'll just talk a little bit, because I know we're running out of time, a little bit about analysis of the language in the letter. In particular, I've been interested in the way in which the letter writer um, uses language to both confront and flatter the authorities as he tries to get them to return the land. Um, and that involves looking in a little bit more detail at the way uh, languages convey honor, and then we'll get to honor in the Tamuka text. So in our language, English, uh, you know, there are particular kind of titles you might use before an honorable person, like sir or lord, or something like that. In other languages, like Spanish, you might have a familiar and a more respectful pronoun, like tu and usted. But in uh, some languages, in uh, the Americas um, and other parts of the world, you get much more elaborate grammatical indication of honor. So in uh, Nahuatl, which is the language of the Aztecs, classical Nahuatl, we've got an ordinary word for house. But if it's an honorable house, the one that's associated with honorable people, there's going to be a special suffix on the noun that shows that it's honorable. And when we take a verb like he died, that's the simple way to say it, o mic. But if an honorable person dies, you have to say, o mo miki li, with these extra little parts in here, being literally, he died to himself, right? So the form of the verb shows you whether um, you're talking about an ordinary person or an honored person. And um, I've been, since I've been working with the language for some number of years, I've found that there's an honorific system in Tmukla as well, not described in this arte or other materials. But when you look especially at things that uh, deal with honored and regular people, you see that honored people get special kinds of verb agreement and noun agreement. So there is a little particle, ano or ani, which is used when the subject object or possessed noun is honored. There's a possessive suffix mitono for uh, second or third person possess, possessor honor. And then there's a special use of the passive me. And uh, our corpus is primarily Christian Tamuqua text. We don't know early on, but it seems to me that um, this system must be really old in Tamuqua. Um, and uh, the two secular letters show the same honorific system going on. Uh, the complexity of this honorific system uh, really argues that it's not, a, it's not sort of some invention of Christian missionaries, but it's some deep part of Tamuqua grammar. Um, it shows a lot of parallels with the Aztec or Nahuatl system of honoring people. And uh, if you look at languages around the world that have this kind of grammar of honor, uh, they're almost always found in societies with really high social stratification. So this would be like a uh, you know societies with like an emperor and you know the stinkers at the bottom, <laughs> right? So like very high and very low, and the language is kind of indexing this big social difference between different people. So uh, we do think that Tamuqua society had a social hierarchy, but we don't have a lot of details on how it worked exactly. We know that there were chiefs and nobles, um, but a lot of 
you know, um, colonial powers are not very good at understanding the system of hierarchy among the native people and describing it properly. So I'll give you some examples, and then we'll look at how they apply to uh, the letter. So this ano ani particle goes before something that is honored. So uh, if you just wanted to say our Lord, that would be anoko nika. But this extra little particle on or ano uh, tell, gives it a special honorific tick. So it means our honorable Lord, not just our Lord. Okay. Um, this can also show up when the object of the sentence is uh, honored. So here's an example from the letter. So Don Mel, Manuel writes, we were, uh, or they were honoring the king and serving him and working for him. And because the king is an honorable person, when we talk about honoring the king, we use the honorific particle before it. Serving him, we get the honorific particle. And working for him, we also get the honorific particle. So over and over again, if the object of the verb is honored, you have to put the little ano particle on there to show that. And also, if the subject is honorific, you have to put ano in. So from the letter, line 34 of the letter, he says, a white chief came and, so here we have, he came, and then we get the honorific particle before said. He came and said. Similarly, the king has been merciful with clothes for the body. And here, the king is the subject of this verb, be merciful. So we get the honorific particle before it. I think it's the white chief, who okay. It's a relative clause. Put him on. So you mean it's the white chief who has come? Who has come, yeah. Uh-huh. You might be right. Yeah, thanks, Doug. OK. Um, if the possessor of some noun is honorific, we get a, a different suffix, retono. So if I want to say um, his son of some regular person, I just have a me suffix. But if I'm talking about the son of somebody important, I put this mitono instead. So the white person's chief. His son, who is the, the, the son of an honorable person, Mitono. Right? So you can see that here he again talks about with honor about the, uh, the governor, the king, the son of the white person's chief. And then um, also uh, the verb uh, will show us a, a passive suffix, ni, if the subject is honorable. So this is also from this letter. The king has been merciful with clothes for the body. We, uh, sorry, the white chief's son has come. Before we were focused on the mitono, but also look and see that the verb come has a, a special suffix on it. And the king has been merciful. Be merciful has the me suffix on it. So the, the verb has a little suffix to show the honor. It has a little particle before to show the honor. The possessed thing shows the honor. So the, the language is dripping with honor when it comes to describing certain kinds of people and not others. Okay. So Don Manuel, the uh, author of this text, he sh deploys the full honorific resources of the language to mark almost every word of the relevant sentence to show deference to the governor. Uh, he does not do that when he's describing the actions of the overseer and the various people who abuse them. Right. So um, that would be, have been really clear to the Mukwa audience. It's in the same way in English, you know, I say, oh yes, uh, uh, Dr. Johnson said such and such, and then Joe said blah, blah, blah. So some people are being elevated, and some people are not being elevated in this text. Right? So uh, Don Mel Manuel uses the same honorifics for the governor and God, which is a kind of flattery, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, the translation of this into Spanish doesn't show you any of this, basically. The Spanish is blind to the honorific system going on in the language. So if you're able to read the language in the original, you can start to see the subtlety with which it was composed and the way in which the writer distinguishes between honorable and non-honorable people. Um, a good question for historical analysis um, is, the honorific usage a sign of his subservience, or is it a kind of diplomacy? Right? 
you know, it, there was a time at which people used to write each other letters, and at the end they would write, your obedient servant, John Smith. Well, he wasn't really their servant, right? But it was a polite fiction at the time to kind of flatter people, powerful people in this way. So we think that's probably why the text is so flattering to the governor. He's trying to get something out of it. He's trying to butter him up linguistically. So I will not keep you too much longer. I'm happy to have questions. But I just wanted to come to the conclusion that this text is uh, both linguistically and historically important. Uh, linguistically, it's one of the few examples of a native language and native authored text, especially from this period of history. And because it happened, it was authored not too far from here, um, it's also very relevant to understand the Florida history. And um, historically, this letter also shows how Tamiqua people understood, mediated, and responded to the colonial pressures that were going on, the ways in which they fought back and resisted uh, Spanish attempts to take their land and take their rights. And what's great about this letter, I think, is that it gives us a native voice from uh, the mid-17th century. And we rarely hear a voice like that. So that's the end of my talk tonight. I'm happy to take all the questions you have. Start in the back. I saw first and then. Why Jesus Maria? Good question. Um, we think this is some sort of indication of piety on the, the letter writer's part, but it is um, a little peculiar. Um, it kind of suggests that um, maybe the letter writer is just trying to throw out like maybe two of the most frequent words of the Catholic <laughs> service <laughs> in front of this letter, just to reassure the reader, oh yes, I am a Christian and I like Jesus and Mary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you know when the last speaker Nobody really knows that, but probably sometime in the 18th century, the language ceased to be spoken. Oh, that's really true. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Going back to the confessional. Yeah. The slide about consent. Yes. I think it was more than just the issue that the priest was being left <coughs> out, but it's the difference between matrimonial and um, matrilinear and patrilinear society, because in the Catholic marriage, the man chooses first. Yes. I take you to be my wife. Mm -hmm. And the question was, did you do it in the native way? Mm -hmm. And that would be the woman yeah. choosing the man. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. The, the priest shows up as the one to enforce the, the patriarchal, the patriarchal way. So if yeah. you leave him out, then you get to do it. The woman gets her choice first. I think that's right. You know, what we see in the Tumupa text is much more uh, balance kind of gender equality. So um, I'm not going to give you, I don't want to give the false impression that this was a, a paradise or anything like that. But Native society at that time was far less patriarchal and sexist than Spanish culture was. Women had a great deal of power and authority um, in uh, Native Florida at that point. Tumupa society was matrilineal. Uh, there are records of female chiefs as well as male chiefs at the time. Um, and so this uh, expression of the marriage thing does, I think, uh, stress mutual consent, like they choose each other. But it is definitely different from the Spanish practice. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, in, in all your, your work and everything, and, and when you talk the language, do yeah. you think that's the way they talked. Was there punctuation, uh, inflections, or any rhythm to, to it? Yeah, so um, of course we can never be completely sure. But some of the texts have accent marking on the words to show you where the stress is supposed to fall. So uh, from that we've been kind of we've been able to figure out probable stress patterns for the words. Mm -hmm. And because different authors wrote different versions. We also see different people writing the same word, which gives us uh, multiple points of view on the proper pronunciation of it. Uh, so like I said, we will never know exactly, but we do have some evidence that helps us understand what's likely to be the correct pronunciation. Yes, sir. 
Before the Spanish were here, was there, was there a written language? No, there was no written language in um, uh, north of Mexico before the Europeans. So what impact? So how do you know what impact the Spanish language, the writing in the Spanish, the whole structure of the Spanish language <coughs> had on the way the two uh, communicated? And yeah. how much, how much uh, um, ha does the Spanish language kind of pollute the, the language? Yeah. Of the well, we do see Spanish loan words into Tamuqua, you know, especially for things that were Spanish practices that don't have a Tamuqua equivalent. Mm -hmm. So we see, for example, you know, borrowings of words like baptismo mm -hmm. and catechismo. Um, other kinds of European practices like that, gato. as well as European animals. Yeah. Do you have other examples? Of Let's say gato. Let's gato for cat. Quaresma for the left. Quaresma for left. But you know, if you look at the grammar of the language, you don't see any Spanish influence because the language is absolutely could not be more different than Spanish. Mm -hmm. Right. And how did they have a sense of how to construct the grammar? In, lang in written language. Yeah, so the Franciscans at that point were branching out to all the new Spanish territories in the world. And they had a little bit of training in how to listen to a language and write it. It was something like a missionary boot camp. And part of the lessons involved how to write these sort of things. There might, it might be that Pareja was trained for a bit in Mexico before coming to Florida. And so he had a little bit of sense of how you could listen to a word and try to write down what you're hearing. Yes, in the back. Could one of you speak to Muslim and just let us hear what it sounds like? Uh, like in conversation? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not a lot of conversation to That's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. That's actually translated in the arte as como estas. Right? So it's like, <laughs> the same thing you learn on the first day of Spanish class, but in the first day of class. I could read this very nice little passage here. Ano pira comeleta ni amate nata hibuasi mota, viro manacunata hibuaso mata mosovicho. Sound good? Te wata chi tera bi. Chi tera bi. Oh, Teda, Teru, Teru. <laughs> so I said, I said speaking, you yeah. did great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Other questions from anyone? All right, well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you all so much for coming up tonight. I really appreciate it. Good to St. Augustine. That was the final.